My name is John Stephen Piper. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Nutritional Sciences in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto and a staff physician at St. Michael's Hospital. It is my pleasure to be able to present to you nutrition therapy and chronic disease moving from evidence to guidelines to clinical practice. These are my disclosures. Let's start with the problem. The dual epidemics of obesity and diabetes represent two of the most important unmet prevention and treatment challenges. This is illustrated very nicely by data from uh, the United States Centers for Disease Control. I'm going to show you a series of maps going from the mid-90s up to present day showing the incredible increase in prevalence that has occurred. If you look at the maps as the colors go from light to darker, the prevalence is increasing. I think you'll be impressed by the uh, incredible and dramatic increases over the last 20 years. If we start in 1994 and move forward, we can see that the prevalence is increasing steadily. And I'll keep clicking through all the way until we get the mid 2000s, where we see the map is becoming very dark. The prevalences are uh, quite high, over uh, 9% uh, for diabetes. Um, the same applies to Canada. So if we look at Canadian data from ISIS, what we see is over the last 20 years or so, and this data actually represents about 10 years of data from the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, there's been a doubling in the increase of diabetes. If you look at the green um, line, this represents all cases uh, in all people of diabetes. We see that the numbers have, uh, are reaching almost 10% for prevalence. Um, diabetes, both obesity and diabetes represent um, important uh, drivers um, of cardiometabolic uh, complications that they precipitate. In particular, this is the case for uh, cardiovascular disease and coronary heart disease. Uh, where diabetes represents an important driver. And at the, this point, uh, what the diabetes and obesity may do is undo uh, many of the gains that we have achieved through smoking cessation and improved uh, blood pressure and cholesterol control by increasing, um, leading to increases in coronary heart disease. And this slide just illustrates the relationship between diabetes and coronary heart disease in a meta-analysis of systematic reviews, sorry, a meta-analysis of prospective cohort studies in almost a, a million participants. Is, does this provide an opportunity for diet? What is the role? Uh, is there a role for diet? Well, yes, of course there's a role for diet. Uh, diet universally is considered the cornerstone of both prevention and treatment uh, for obesity, diabetes, and their downstream cardiometabolic complications, in particular coronary heart disease. Traditionally, uh, diet recommendations, however, have been very nutrient-centric. Uh, they've focused on low carb, or sorry, rather low fat, or high carb, or low carb, or high protein, uh, which has been very difficult to translate because it's very easy to eat both a good or bad diet that's, that's any of those. Um, the guidelines have moved since then to emphasizing the quality of uh, nutrients, um, high quality carbohydrates, healthy fats, healthy proteins. However, this has its own translational issues um, and that it's very difficult in a, a physician-patient interaction that's quite short to be able to communicate that effectively. Guidelines now have shifted. There's been a large paradigm shift to more food and dietary pattern-based approaches, which is reflected here. So in the case of the Canadian Diabetes Association, this shift uh, occurred prior to our 2013 guidelines, where we moved from these more nutrient-centric sets of recommendations to food and dietary pattern-based recommendations. Well, what do the Canadian Diabetes Association's guidelines tell us? Well, if we look at the Canadian Diabetes Association guidelines, we've set up an algorithm uh, for the approach to nutrition counseling uh, for in, in primary care. Um, the start of the algorithm is involving a dietitian wherever possible. This is incredibly important um, as uh, that skill set is, is certainly required and the time that comes with that also required. It then moves, we're moving down the algorithm to intensive lifestyle intervention involving both diet and physical activity to achieve and maintain a healthy body weight. Uh, the next step is to counsel on diet. And to do that, what the Canadian Diabetes Association uh, Committee recognized is there is no one best diet for diabetes. There's a number of different diets and dietary strategies and approaches which have been tested, each of which have their own advantages and disadvantages. And the ideal situation is to work with the values and preferences and treatment goals of the patient um, to be able to uh, select the diet that best fits um, with those. So what we've done is provided another table, uh, which you can see on the, uh, the right of the slide, um, which details the advantages and disadvantages reviewing the evidence uh, for um, a series of dietary strategies, starting first with more traditional uh, macronutrient or nutrient-centric strategies, but then moving down to dietary patterns and food-based approaches, which have the greatest translational capacity in terms of one's ability to communicate that to patients. 
the idea is one works with the, value, the advantages and disadvantages to fit the diet to the values and preferences and treatment goals of the patient. Um, then the diet is adjusted every two to three months um, along with pharmacotherapy to achieve targets. Well, what do the Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines say? Well, they say they've taken a very similar approach. Uh, what we've done is we've uh, also emphasized that there is no one best diet, reviewed um, the totality of the evidence on different diets um, so that one can have that discussion with one's patient. So if we look here at the algorithm for the 2016 Clinical Practice Guidelines for Nutrition Therapy for the Canadian Cardiovascular Society, um, what you can see is that um, there's a, a series of steps in terms of screening and assessing and uh, restratifying the patient and then all categories uh, would, um, would be subjected to um, health uh, behavioral modification. Uh, when, when it comes to diet, one then needs to look at the evidence for the diets which were reviewed. We reviewed um, a series of diets which were considered important to uh, a multitude of, of stakeholders and where we have evidence from the Mediterranean diet through to um, vegetarian diets. Uh, this represents the evidence uh, for cardiovascular risk reduction where it has been graded. Importantly, when one looks at these um, diets, one must interpret them in the context Context of values and preferences and so we've included a values and preferences statement which you can read which indicates that adherence to any one um, diet um, is really contingent uh, upon working with the values and preferences of the individual to best fit that diet taking into account the culinary uh, abilities uh, environmental concerns ecological concerns all of the values and preferences that a, uh, a patient may have um, if that was for cardiovascular risk reduction, if we look for LDL cholesterol lowering, which we consider important in the context of the Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines, uh, as it represents an established therapeutic target for clinical decision making, both for the initiation and the titration uh, of therapy, we see a similar review of the evidence for a series of uh, dietary patterns uh, with a values and preferences statement, which again emphasizes the need to work with the values and preferences of the patient to find a diet that they're most um, able to to uh, follow and sustain. Uh, what also is, is recognized um, in this uh, particular review of the evidence is that uh, diet is not, um, does not have to be regarded, or dietary interventions or individual dietary interventions don't have to be regarded as uh, in a silo in that they, can, they are additive, they can be summed to receive further uh, cholesterol lowering as has been illustrated by the portfolio diet concept. How do I translate these guidelines then into clinical practice as a physician? Well, to do that, what I've done is I've set up a case, which I think will illustrate very nicely how one can go from the evidence to the guidelines which I've presented to um, clinical practice. Um, this case involves a, a patient that um, I saw at St. Michael's Hospital in the Lipid Clinic. This is a 74-year-old gentleman with mixed dyslipidemia, dyslipidemia and metabolic syndrome. Uh, he was referred for hyperlipidemia with an inability to meet targets. His past medical history was significant for hypertension, colon cancer, which was in remission, and hypothyroidism, which was well controlled. His medications um, were atorvastatin, 80 milligrams, azetamide, 10 milligrams daily, um, amlodipine, 5 milligrams daily, and synthroid, 0 0.025 milligrams daily. Importantly, uh, when one looks at the medications, one must appreciate that he's on dual maximal therapy for cholesterol lowering. In terms of his history of presenting illness, uh, he was diagnosed in 2010 on routine um, workup by his family physician. No secondary uh, causes of his dyslipidemia were identified, and there were no complications, uh, or there had been no complications of his dyslipidemia in terms of heart disease, stroke, or peripheral vascular disease, and he had a negative stress test, a negative 24-hour Holter. In terms of CV, CV risk factors, we identified that he had visceral obesity. He was an ex-15 pack year smoker, he had hypertension, but he did not have diabetes and no family history of premature cardiovascular disease. On dietary and lifestyle assessment, um, it was determined that he was a high red meat eater. Uh, he consumed a lot of refined starch, uh, low fiber intake, and low fruits and vegetables. On exam, there was no stigmata of hyperlipidemia. Uh, he was overweight um, by WHO criteria with a BMI of 29.8 uh, kilograms per meter squared. He had a large waist circumference, which would be considered elevated um, at 102 centimeters. Um, he had um, elevated uh, blood pressure. Uh, otherwise, the exam was unremarkable. When we look at his laboratory investigations, um, what we see when we look at the lipid panel in particular, I want you to pay attention, his LDL cholesterol was um, 6.25 
um, and it had reduced on uh, that was off treatment on dual maximal therapy um, only down to uh, 3.18 which didn't meet our target of, of a greater than or equal to 50 percent reduction and hence the uh, referral his hemoglobin a1c was um, 6.1 percent otherwise he had normal thyroid liver and renal tests and his Framingham risk score, um, which is his risk for cardiovascular disease over the next 10 years, was greater than 30%, which would put him at high risk. So what was our assessment of recommendations? Well, we diagnosed him as having mixed dyslipidemia uh, on a background of metabolic syndrome, where he had uh, four of the features of, of the five features of metabolic syndrome. And his lipid targets that we identified would be to achieve a greater than or equal to 50% reduction in LDL cholesterol, or less than or equal to two millimoles per liter uh, in LDL cholesterol. Um, on, given that he was on maximal dual therapy already for cholesterol lowering, what was our approach? And in particular, would, would nutrition be useful here? Um, we recognized that he had high blood pressure, so we did uh, start him on ramipril 10 milligrams uh, daily. Well, the first question is, do we have evidence that this patient would benefit from dietary therapy? Well, I think we do have evidence, and that was reviewed for you when we looked at the guidelines. If we actually look at the evidence uh, for the portfolio diet, which is a diet that we do counsel on, uh, as it has a lot of um, uh, flexibility in terms of um, the ability to translate it into clinical practice, what we see here is we have evidence moving from efficacy to effectiveness to guidelines. So if we look at the evidence uh, from the first efficacy study that was done versus head-to-head -head study versus lovastatin, we see that one was able to achieve or the participants in the trial were able to achieve approximately 30% reduction, which was comparable to that of an early generation statin, lovastatin at 20 milligrams um, daily. When this moved to an effectiveness trial, which was a large multi-center trial uh, done across Canada, we saw that those um, reductions did translate. They were lessened in the real world uh, scenario where it's dietary counseling and not all foods are provided, but one was uh, on average participants were able to achieve approximately a 15, 10 to 15% reduction with a dose response where greater adherence to the components of the portfolio led to greater reductions. And this has led to the guidelines which I reviewed for you and the specific guidelines as they relate to the portfolio diet, which I've identified here for cardiovascular risk reduction at the top um, of the third panel on the right and LDL cholesterol lowering in the bottom panel of the third column on the right. So well, how do I prescribe diet? How do I go from uh, these guidelines to prescribing it in clinic. Well, if we look at the portfolio diet, the portfolio diet is based on four pillars. Uh, those four pillars uh, involve uh, cholesterol lowering foods, all of which have FDA or Health Canada approved health claims for cholesterol lowering. They include nuts, vegetable protein or plant protein um, from soy uh, products and dietary pulses like beans, peas, chickpeas and lentils, as well as uh, simulated uh, meat uh, products and meat analogs. It includes viscous uh, fiber uh, and it includes um, plant sterols. Well, how do I counsel on this? Well, what we do is we write a prescription. Every patient um, that comes to the clinic will get a prescription. And the advantage of a diet like this in terms of the counseling, when one only has about eight minutes uh, for counseling, is it's just four concepts. It's sort of a high-level approach. We first of all name the diet, which is important, so that both the patient and the physician and the dietitian and the team understand the diet we're talking about. And then we identify the four key principles um, of the diet with very varied um, simple uh, instructions for how one uh, can achieve the targets with specific foods uh, below. The patient then on every subsequent follow-up visit can discuss each one of those um, or any one of those uh, at each visit and can also take those uh, to the dietitian to further um, operationalize them. The advantages is, uh, are in the discussion is it's not an all or nothing concept in that one is better than two, sorry, two is better than one, three is better than two, and four is better than three in terms of um, the, the components. And the more compliant or adherent a participant is, the greater the LDL cholesterol lowering. Well, when we applied this to our case, what did we find? Well, what we did is we both counseled on this diet as well as uh, increasing exercise to achieve 150 minutes of exercise uh, per week, um, as well as uh, maintaining him on his uh, dual maximal therapy of uh, 80, grams, 80 milligrams sorry, of atorvastatin and 10 milligrams of azetamide. And what we found was quite a marked reduction. So if we look at the data for LDL cholesterol, which is our main um, therapeutic target, when he came in off of medication, his blood cholesterol, LDL cholesterol was 6.25 millimoles per liter. It reduced to 3.18 on dual maximal therapy, which was not at target. When we, uh, he started to follow the portfolio diet, he was able to reduce that further uh, to 1.88 millimoles per liter, uh, which was quite a, an outstanding reduction. And then with uh, further fine tuning and optimization of that diet um, on subsequent follow-up, it reduced to 1.4 millimoles per liter. 
Um, overall, if one looks at this, it represents a 78% reduction in LDL cholesterol, which more than meets our targets. But importantly, it represents a 56% reduction or additional reduction beyond the dual maximal therapy that the patient was on. So it allowed uh, us to achieve our targets um, for this patient. What are the conclusions? Well, dietary guidelines have moved away from nutrient-based recommendations, so-called low-fat, low-carb, high-protein, to more food and dietary pattern-based recommendations. Comprehensive dietary patterns that combine the advantages um, of different foods, example being the portfolio diet as we worked through with the case, result in clinically meaningful improvements in risk factors that are associated with cardiovascular benefit and that are comparable to those seen with uh, medications. Physicians, um, with the assistance of a registered dietitian where possible, can have an important impact in prescribing diet and exercise to their patients. So I encourage you to um, have that discussion with your patient um, at every visit. With that, I thank you for your attention.